The enemy wants you to forget that the Holy Spirit gives to you dominion, power, and authority. You have been rescued from the kingdom of darkness. Acts chapter 26 verse 18 says this, to open their eyes so they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God. Then they will receive forgiveness for their sins and be given a place among God's people who are set apart by faith in me. You've been snatched from the kingdom of darkness. You've been set free by the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, even though we recognize that God has given to us dominion, not through us, but through his son, even though we recognize that we have that, we don't always see the manifestation of that dominion in our everyday lives. We know in our minds, in our hearts, in our spirits, that God has given us the victory, that we have been delivered, that we are children of the Most High, that we do walk in his authority because of the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit within us. But it seems sometimes that what we experience in everyday life doesn't seem to align with what we see in Scripture. We know in Scripture, the Bible says, Ephesians 2, 2, wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. Notice here that the Scripture tells us that it was in times past that we walked according to that power, to that spirit of this world. Now, as believers, we walk according to the Holy Spirit. We are of a new kingdom. Colossians 1.13 says, Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. That is past tense. He hath delivered us. We are delivered. We are set free. So the question is, how now? Do we walk in that dominion and power? We're going to get deep into the word to talk about this dominion. I'm going to go through several scriptures. I want you to prepare your heart. Ask the Holy Spirit to open your eyes and your spiritual ears. And I want you to truly begin to surrender areas in your life that you know are not aligning to what the scripture says. Write this in the comment section. Jesus is Lord. If you believe he has all power, all authority, all dominion, then write, Jesus is Lord. If you believe you are seated with him in heavenly places, then write, Jesus is Lord. Make that a public declaration. Jesus is Lord. Let's take a look now at the fall of Satan, because in order to understand this spiritual conflict, this war being waged for dominion within the earth, we have to look back at the beginning. Revelation chapter 12, verses 7 through 9 says this. Then war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. And the dragon and his angels fought, but they did not prevail. Nor was there a place for them in heaven any longer. The great dragon was cast out, that ancient serpent called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast down to the earth, and his angels were cast down with him. So Satan rebels against God with his minions, and obviously he's defeated. I don't even know if we should necessarily refer to this as a spiritual struggle, because this was more of an extermination. The enemy didn't even stand a chance. It was an easy win for the kingdom of heaven. Now the question becomes, when did this occur? Because we know that Satan was banished from heaven. But when did this happen? Because in establishing the when, we get clues into the why. When we can see clearly the timeline of how this all occurred, then we begin to understand what was the catalyst for the enemy rebelling against God. We know that this was definitely after the creation of the earth. We know that Satan fell after the creation of the earth. Though it might seem obvious, I need to point out to you the fact that Revelation chapter 12, verse 9 says that the enemy was banished from heaven, cast out, and sent where? To the earth. Tell me in the comment section. He was sent to the earth. Now, maybe silly to say, but in order for the enemy to be banished to the earth, the earth had to already exist. And so we have that clue. We know that this happened after the creation 
of the earth. And I believe this happened also after the creation of man. Genesis chapter 1, verse 31, we see that the scripture says that the Lord looked down at his creation and he saw that it was good, complete. He would not have called it good had there been a fallen creation running around within the earth. The earth as a whole, everything in it at that point was good. So I believe that the enemy fell sometime after the creation of man. We know that Jesus, of course, speaks to witnessing this occur in Luke chapter 10, verses 17 through 19. The 70 returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us through your name. He said to them, I saw Satan as lightning fall from heaven. Look, I give you authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Now we look at Isaiah chapter 14. Go there. Isaiah 14, I'm going to read verses 12 through 16, and we're going to see a prophetic parallel. Isaiah giving the king of Babylon a warning from the heavenly throne. And in this warning, we see, as I said, a prophetic parallel. The prophet is warning the king that he is like unto Satan. And so in this prophetic warning, we see, yes, that warning, but we also see a picture being painted, giving us a little bit more detail as to what happened during that rebellion. Isaiah 14, 12 through 16. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell, to the sides of the pit, that they, they that see thee shall narrowly look upon thee, and consider thee, saying, Is this the man that made the earth to tremble, that did shake kingdoms? Now again, this is a warning from Isaiah the prophet to the king of Babylon. But in this warning, that king of Babylon is being compared to Satan. And in that comparison, that prophetic comparison, we see that Satan had it in his heart that he would ascend into heaven. He wanted to usurp the divine authority that only the heavenly father carried. Now, we see another prophetic parallel given to us, this time giving us insight into what was going on in the Garden of Eden. Look at Ezekiel chapter 28, verses 12 through 14. And this is Ezekiel's warning, a message to the king of Tyre. Son of man, sing this funeral song for the king of Tyre. Give him this message from the sovereign Lord. You were the model of perfection, full of wisdom and exquisite in beauty. Now, here's how we know that this king is being compared to Satan. You were in Eden, the garden of God, ordained and anointed you as the mighty angelic guardian. Now, here we see that Satan had spent some time in the garden of Eden before he experienced the fallen state. You had access to the holy mountain of God and walked among the stones of fire. You were blameless in all you did from the day you were created until the day evil was found in you. So here we see a powerful insight. Satan spent time in the Garden of Eden before his fallen state and he had access between heaven and earth. Now, we know this wasn't his fallen state because that's what's being lamented here. The fact that he was once so exquisite, so beautiful. And he had that access to the Garden of Eden when he was in his heavenly state. Now, this means, again, that this fall of Satan must have come after the creation of man. Because we know that man was created to tend to the garden, to tend to the earth, to be a good steward of the creation. And then we see the picture fully forming. Think about this. Satan rebels against God. We know, of course, that he did. Revelation 12, 9. And many have said that it was his pride that caused him to rebel. Yes, it was his pride. But what was that pride focused on? What was it that put it in his mind that he could be like God? 
What was it that caused him to be disrupted? Think about this. For all eternity, if you could even make a time reference to eternity, but for the sake of communication, we'll say it that way. For all of eternity, Satan had served the Heavenly Father. No disruptions, no issues, no problems. And suddenly something changes. And he gets it in his mind that he deserves to be like God. He deserves to have authority. He deserves to have power. What was it? What was the catalyst? What was the triggering event? Where did Satan get this idea? He could be like God. Let me know if you know it in the comments section. Where did he get this idea that he could be like God? Genesis 126 gives us the answer. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. Satan saw the nature of God in man. I'm not saying man is God. I'm saying that God breathed his spirit into man. God gave to man dominion. God made man a partner in the earth. Satan sees this. And you can imagine that this exquisite, angelic, beautiful creation was filled with pride when he saw that man, not he, but man, was given dominion and authority. It was at this moment that I believe that Satan had it entered in his heart that he should be like God, that he should be in charge. I believe that Satan fell not just because of his pride, but because of his jealousy for what God gave to you. He saw that dominion and power being handed over to man. I'm sure he thought of us as a lowly creation, even as far back as then. Watch what happens here. Let's read again, Revelation chapter 12. Let's read verses 7 through 8 and watch this with fresh eyes. We read this, then war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought, but they did not prevail, nor was there a place for them in heaven any longer. The great dragon was cast out, that ancient serpent called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast down to the earth, and his angels were cast down with him. Well, who was in charge in the earth? It was man. So in order to humble Satan as a part of his punishment, Satan was forced to go under the dominion of man since the beginning. And so he looks and he sees, this isn't right. I should be in charge. He rebels against God, wants to usurp that authority. God punishes him, sends him to the earth where man has dominion. Where man is ruling and reigning. Where man is acting partner of God. Where man is to steward creation. That's what happened in the heavenly realm. That's what happened in the earth. And so there's been this power struggle ever since then. Satan, having always looked down upon us because of his jealousy for what God gave to us, and then trying to usurp what God gave to, to us by way of rebellion. Now, in a moment, I want to talk to you about how man lost that dominion, how Christ regained that dominion, and how you can walk in that dominion because of who you are in Christ. But first, I want to mention that my book, Holy Spirit, The Bondage Breaker, Experience Permanent Deliverance from Mental, Emotional, and Demonic Strongholds is available now at bondagebreaker.com. In this book, I talk about experiencing permanent deliverance. Many of us have sought freedom in certain areas that we've struggled with for years, and it seems sometimes that we get set free, maybe for a couple of weeks, maybe for a few months, and then the trouble starts to come back again. I want to show you how to get to the problem at its very root that it might forever be done away with, and that you might walk in freedom and power and authority and victory all the days of your life. Also in this book, I cover in greater detail what I'm covering here, the fall of Satan and dominion. I also answer, some of you may know what this is, some of you may not. I also talk a little bit about the gap theory. Some people say, well, wasn't there a creation before Adam and Eve? And we, we dispel that myth, myth at least um, superficially, so that the point can stand that you might see what was happening in the heavenly realm. So you can get that at bondagebreaker.com. Now let's take a look at the fall of man. So Satan is banished to the earth. We have some clues as to when this happened because we read the Genesis account, we read the prophetic parallels, and this places the fall of Satan sometime after the creation of man. Now, Satan knew that he could not ascend any longer. Why? Because he was in a fallen state. 
He had rebelled, and now he's in a fallen state, and he can't recover from that. So his only hope at gaining dominion over man wasn't that he might again ascend to power. Satan's only hope at gaining dominion over man was that he might get man to rebel and therefore fall. Genesis 2, 15 through 17, the Lord God placed man in the garden of Eden to tend and watch over it. But the Lord God warned him, you may, eat, you may freely eat the fruit of every tree in the garden, except the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. If you eat its fruit, you are sure to die. So here we see that God places these trees. And one of them, of course, we know is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. One of them we know is a tree of life. And God tells them, you're not to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now, some might look at this and say, well, it seems to me that God set Adam and Eve up for failure. After all, if they didn't have the knowledge of good and evil before they ate of the tree, isn't that somewhat of a catch-22? In other words, don't eat of the tree, but you have to eat of the tree to know that it's wrong. Well, that's not exactly what's happening here. You see, this phrase, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, is what we call a merism. And a merism is, as I have written here, a merism is a rhetorical term for a pair of contrasting words or phrases such as near and far, body and soul, life and death, used to express totality and completeness. Now, you can see, for example, a series of merisms and wedding vows, for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health. In other words, you're saying, no matter what the circumstance, I'm going to be committed. So if I say I searched near and far, I'm saying I searched everywhere. If I say, welcome, ladies and gentlemen, then I'm welcoming everyone. So amerism, again, contrasting words to express completeness, totality. So this phrase, good and evil, it was a tree of the knowledge of good and evil, is basically telling us that this was an actual literal tree. And when they ate of this fruit, they were given vast amounts of knowledge. It's not as though that they didn't know right and wrong before eating of that fruit, it's just that this fruit would give to them vast amounts of knowledge. Again, it's a merism, the knowledge of good and evil and everything in between. You get lots of knowledge. But they already had the conscience. They already knew right and wrong. Why? Because they knew God was good. And if you know God is good, then you know by comparison what is not good. So Adam and Eve weren't ignorant. They knew what they were doing was wrong. And this tree didn't give them the knowledge of whether or not they were doing something wrong. Rather, this tree gave them vast amounts of knowledge. So again, a merism used to express totality, telling us that this tree, this fruit, would give to them a vast amount of knowledge, worldly knowledge, if you will, or knowledge about the earth and so forth. Now, this is where Satan begins to tempt them. Remember, he's banished to the earth. He's now under their dominion. And he wants to regain dominion over them, or he wants to gain dominion over them, I should say. But he knows he cannot ascend to a higher place, so he has to get them to come down to a fallen state. And this is his motive here that we see in Genesis chapter 3, beginning at verse 1. The serpent was the shrewdest of all the wild animals the Lord God had made. One day he asked the woman, did God really say, you must not eat the fruit from any of these trees in the garden? Of course we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, the woman replied. It's only the fruit from the tree in the middle of the garden that we are not allowed to eat. God said, you must not eat it or even touch it. If you do, you will die. You will not die, the serpent replied. So notice here, first, the serpent questions the word, and then he contradicts the word. So when Satan's trying to gain dominion over you, the first thing he'll get you to do is question the word. I'm telling you, I'm exposing the enemy tonight in your life. The areas in our lives where we aren't experiencing dominion are areas of great deception. All spiritual bondage is rooted in spiritual deception. All spiritual defeat comes from spiritual deception. Defeat comes from deception. And if you walk in truth, then you have dominion. This is why the enemy wants you to first question the word. The moment he causes you to question the word, now you're becoming vulnerable to his lies and his contradictions of the word that place you under deception, that put you under different dominion. So you will not die, the serpent replied to the woman. God knows that your eyes will be opened as soon as you eat it. 
and you will be like God, knowing both good and evil. The woman was convinced. She saw that the tree was beautiful and its fruit looked delicious. And she wanted the wisdom it would give her. So she took some of the fruit and ate it. Then she gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it too. At that moment, their eyes were opened and they suddenly felt shame at their nakedness. So they sewed fig leaves together to cover themselves. Now, it's not that they were just suddenly ashamed of their nakedness for the sake of the nakedness itself. Rather, it's that they became a fallen creation. And in that fallen state, suddenly their nakedness became something about which they should feel shame. But before then, they were, they were, they were living in God's perfection unbroken fellowship. They were not in a fallen state. They were living as God intended them to live. They were existing as God created them to exist. And so now they sin and they experience a fallen state. And in their fallen state, their nakedness became shameful because their beings had changed. They, they were different now. Genesis 3, through 24. Then the Lord God said, look, the human beings have become like us, knowing both good and evil. And again, that's the merism. They have vast amounts of knowledge. What if they reach out, take fruit from the tree of life and eat it? Then they will live forever. So the Lord God banished them from the garden of Eden. And he sent Adam out to cultivate the ground from which he had been made. After sending them out, the Lord God stationed mighty cherubim to the east of the garden of Eden. And he placed a flaming sword that flashed back and forth to guard the way of the tree of life. Now, this may seem like God is being cruel. Some might see it that way if they don't understand God's nature. But in fact, it was God's mercy that kept Adam and Eve out of the garden. Why? Think about this. Adam and Eve, after they had eaten the fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, had vast amounts of knowledge. So imagine this. They were existing in a fallen state with vast amounts of knowledge, what were to happen if Adam and Eve, existing in a fallen state with vast amounts of knowledge, were, were they to eat of the tree of life? Well, now they live eternally. And so man would have existed had Adam and Eve been allowed to eat of the tree of life after having eaten the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, Adam and Eve would have existed forever in a fallen state with vast amounts of knowledge. That's just a recipe for disaster. It would have sealed their fate. So God in his mercy keeps them from eating of the tree of life. Now we understand that Christ regains this dominion by coming to earth as a man. Now Adam took from a tree and lost dominion. Jesus gives himself upon a tree and gains dominion. Adam is created to steward the earth, be a partner of God in the earth, and through his sin, experiences a fallen state. Now, Jesus comes, lives a perfect, sinless life, sinless perfection, not one mistake. And in that perfection, regains dominion, power, and authority in the earth. So Adam gave up dominion as a man. Christ reclaims that dominion as a man again. Truly God, truly man. There was never a moment that Jesus wasn't God, so don't hear what I'm not saying. Jesus was truly God, truly man, start to finish, no question about it. Don't ever question the divinity of Christ. For all time, forever, then, now, and into the future, all time, for all eternity, Jesus is God. And there never was an instance where it was otherwise. But again, he came to earth in the form of a man that he might fulfill these obligations that Adam had lapsed on. So Philippians 2, 9 through 11 says this, Therefore God elevated him to the place of highest honor and gave him the name above all other names, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue declare that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now here we see that Jesus now has a name above every name. He regains dominion through sinless perfection, sacrifice on the cross, defeats death in the resurrection, and now he holds dominion, power, and authority. It's not in our hands anymore. It's in his hands. See, if we were holding the keys to authority and dominion ourselves, in our sin, we would give those keys up again. But because Christ came and lived a sinless, perfect life, now he holds the keys to dominion. He, in his earth suit, if you will, he came in the incarnation. Now, in man's place, takes that dominion back, and those keys 
are secured forever in the hands of Jesus, and no one can snatch those keys from his hands. Ephesians 1, 19 through 23, I also pray that you will understand the incredible greatness of God's power for us who believe him. This is the same mighty power that raised Christ from the dead and seated him in the place of honor at God's right hand in the heavenly realms. I love this. Now, he is far above any ruler or authority or power or leader or anything else, not only in this world, but also in the world to come. God has put all things under the authority of Christ and has made him head over all things for the benefit of the church. And the church is his body. It is made full and complete by Christ who fills all things everywhere with himself. Christ is in power and we are in Christ. It's not our authority. It's not our dominion. It's not our power. It belongs to Jesus. But though Christ is the one in power, we are the ones in Christ. We stand in him, in authority, in power and dominion. It's his power, his dominion, his authority, and therefore it can never be lost. Somebody say, thank you, Jesus, in the comment section. I sense a strong anointing just teaching this right now. Thank you, Jesus, for dominion, power, and authority. Thank you, Jesus, that you embarrass the powers of darkness. Thank you, Jesus, that you regained all that which was lost in the garden. Thank you, Jesus, for your sinless perfection. Thank you, Jesus, that your name is far and above every other name. Now, who are we in him? 2 Corinthians 3, 15 through 18. Yes, even today when the when they read Moses' writings, their hearts are covered with that veil. Excuse me, when they read Moses' writings, their hearts are covered with that veil and they do not understand. But whenever someone turns to the Lord, now it's talking about you and me. Whenever someone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. And now we can see what? For the Lord is the spirit and wherever the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. So all of us who have had the veil removed, can see and reflect the glory of the Lord. And the Lord, who is the Spirit, makes us more and more like him as we are changed into his glorious image. So as we look at him, as we see him, we are transformed to become like him. Again, he's God, we are not. He's Lord, we are not. He's King, we are not. He has dominion, power, and authority. We do not have that on our own. We have it in him. But as we see him, as we look to him, now that the veil has been removed, when we focus our minds and our lives and everything about us on Jesus, we become like him by the Holy Spirit for where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. The Holy Spirit is all powerful. There is no spirit more powerful than the Holy Spirit. And by the way, his holy jealousy is agitated when we magnify demonic power and minimize his power. Let's talk less about demons and more about the Holy Spirit because that's the power that we live by. Now, I'm going to say something that may offend you, but I want you to know I'm saying it to you in love, and I'm not saying it for the purpose of offending you. I'm saying this to give you a standard to which you can aspire, and I hope that it actually inspires a faith, a hope in you to know what's available for you to claim. I'm going to say this now. If you are still bound... You are not living the Christian life. If you are still bound, you are not living the Christian life. Look at the New Testament. We do not see the New Testament church going to deliverance services, constantly needing demons cast out of them. Well, first of all, Christians can't have demons. Christians cannot be possessed. We can be attacked, but not possessed. You look in the New Testament, we don't see believers living from defeat to defeat. Sure, they experienced persecution. Sure, they experienced trials and tragedy. But they weren't living in this defeated mindset where they're just saying, oh, you know, the enemy's having his day with me. Oh, the enemy's just defeating me. Oh, you know, it's just one struggle to the next. In the New Testament church, you don't see them going from defeat to defeat or from deliverance to deliverance. They went from glory to glory. They went from deliverance to discipline to dominion. Why am I saying this? I'm saying that everything about deliverance for the believer is described as past tense in the scripture, meaning it's already been done. You've already been set free. We treat deliverance like it's a substance, like it's a liquid. 
that I, oh, I need more deliverance or I need a little bit less deliverance or, or, you know, I had some deliverance. I think I'm going to go for some more deliverance. My friend, deliverance is your standing in Christ. Deliverance is your position in heavenly places. Deliverance is a past tense thing that Christ already completed for you. The question is not getting more deliverance. The question is, are you actually walking in what you've already been given? You see, the enemy's only power over you is the power he can deceive you into giving to him. The enemy likes to exaggerate his power. He lies to you. And by the way, this is one of the lies that keeps believers bound. They visualize themselves just under the enemy. He's got them. He owns them. Doesn't the scripture say we've been delivered from the powers of darkness? Doesn't the scripture say we've been translated into the kingdom of light? Doesn't the scripture say that we're seated with him in heavenly places? Doesn't the scripture teach us that he has the name that's above every other name? Doesn't the scripture teach us that the blood of Jesus is more powerful than your family bloodline? Yet we treat it like it's something that, that, that we have to beg for, that we have to figure out. Oh, if I could just figure out that riddle, if I can just figure out that mystery, if I can just figure out what was happening in my ancestry, my friend, it doesn't work that way. It's not like Ghostbusters. It's not like the movies. Jesus embarrassed the powers of darkness. And when you stand in Christ, you stand in that freedom. And so if you're still bound, it's because you're not walking in what he's given to you. Now, of course, I'm not saying that Christians don't need deliverance. We need deliverance from the flesh on a daily basis. We need deliverance from temptation. We need sometimes deliverance from torment. We need deliverance from deception. Sometimes we need deliverance from people who are ungodly influenced. We need to be set free from things quite often. But I'm talking to you as one who is positioned in Christ. Your position, you have to know that. So you're not, you're not living to get deliverance. You're living from the place of having been delivered. And that's how you begin to walk that victory. Well, how do you do that? Well, you start to believe it. You start to understand that when the enemy tells you he has all this power over you, he's lying. And sometimes it's the fear of that power that he has over us that actually causes most of our problems. It's our belief in his power over us that causes most of our problems. Once you begin to realize, wait a minute. No, the enemy doesn't have power over me just because something went wrong in my life. No, the enemy doesn't have power over me just because a relationship didn't work out. No, the enemy doesn't have power over me just because my business failed. Even in all these things, I'm more than a conqueror. To know that those trials aren't proof that you're bound. To know that tragedy isn't proof that you're bound. To know that anything that's chaotic in your life isn't proof that the enemy's winning. Because even in those things, you have victory. Thank you, Jesus, for opening my eyes. Thank you, Jesus, for opening our eyes. Colossians 1, 12 to 14. Let's read it again. Giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us, to meet, made us meet to be partakers. Listen to this. Listen to this. Giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. Are we in darkness or are we in light? Light and darkness, by the necessity of their very own natures, cannot coexist. That's why the scripture asks, can, can light dwell with darkness? What, what does Satan have to do with Christ? Now, even though that's talking about uh, fellowshipping with unbelievers, connecting with unbelievers, the takeaway universal application in that principle is that light and darkness cannot coexist. And light and darkness is precisely what the scripture uses to describe the powers of Satan and the power of Christ. They, they just don't mingle. The existence of either would mean the absence of the other. So inheritance of the saints in light. Where are you? Are you in darkness or are you in light? What does the scripture say? Write in the comments. Are you in darkness or are you in light? You're in light. Who hath, past tense, delivered us from the power of darkness? What's the power of darkness? That's the devil and his demons, the kingdom, the kingdom of hell. And hath translated us. This is like going to a different dimension here hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. So we're not under that jurisdiction. We've been completely removed from that jurisdiction and placed now under the dominion of Christ Jesus, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Watch this, 1 John 4, 4. But you belong to God, my dear children. You have already won a victory over those people because, watch this now, this is so key. Because the spirit who lives in you is greater than the spirit who lives in the world. Here, the scripture is very clear that one spirit lives in you, the Holy Spirit, and the other does not. 
Ephesians 2, 4 through 6, but God is so rich in mercy and he loved us so much that even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. It is only by God's grace that you have been saved for he raised us from the dead along with Christ. Watch this now. And seated us with him in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ Jesus. That's why the Bible says resist the devil and he will flee. It doesn't say resist the devil and he will fight. He's not that bold. Why? Because there's nothing he fears more than a Christian who knows who they are. That's why it says he flees. Once he sees, oh my goodness, they know the power that they have. Oh my goodness, they know who they are. Oh my goodness, they recognize the authority they have in Christ. I'm out of here. Because the moment you begin to resist, he sees he can't bully you anymore. He sees he can't deceive you into thinking that he has all this power over you anymore. You begin to think according to the scripture, according to the truth, according to the power of the Holy Spirit. He seated us in heavenly places with him. This means Christ is in power. I am in Christ. Christ is seated in heavenly places. I am seated in Christ. When I come against the power of the enemy, it's not me coming against the enemy. It's the Christ in me. That's Christ in me. Jesus living in me by the Holy Spirit, rebuking that power. When you rebuke the enemy, my friend, it's as if Jesus himself is giving that command. Somebody say hallelujah in the comment section. He seated us in heavenly places, heavenly realms, because we are united with Christ. He that is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. 1 John 5, 18. We know that God's children do not make a practice of sinning, for God's son holds them securely, and the evil one cannot touch them. I just said it here, 1 Corinthians 6, 17, but the person who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. John 1, 12. But as many as received him... To them gave he the power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. That's you. You're a son of God. Look, ladies, if I have to be the bride of Christ, you got to be a son of God. Why, why is it important, son of God? Because that sonship comes with inheritance. That sonship comes with authority. That sonship comes with power. That sonship comes with backing. You are a son of God. That's who you are. When you believe, you've been given the right to become a son of God. It's not my nature that I identify anymore with. It's God's nature in me that becomes my identity. It's the Holy Spirit living in me that becomes my identity. You are not your intrusive thoughts. You are not what tempts you. You are not what makes you depressed. You are not your fear or anxiety. You are not your compulsions. You are not your confusion. You are not who your family says you are. You are not what your past says you are. You are who God says you are. And the moment you believe, you become a son of the Most High. My God, that's who you are. Stop identifying with that because the, hear me now, please. This is how the enemy works. The moment you identify with those things of darkness, the moment you begin to think you're defeated, the moment you begin to think you're cursed, the moment you begin to think you're demonized, the moment you begin to think that you belong to Satan, the moment that you begin to think that you're weak and powerless and unable to respond to any of these things, that's when you begin to relinquish the power that God has given to you. Why? Because you live in guilt and shame and insecurity. And because you don't know your identity, now you think, well, I, I don't even deserve to use what God has given me. I don't even deserve to identify as a son of God. I rebuke the enemy. The devil is a liar. First John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins. You are a child of light. That's who you are. You're a carrier of the glory. It's who dwells in you. Where you step, God steps. Stop chasing an atmosphere. You are one. Stop going and following signs. Signs will follow you. The presence of the Holy Spirit dwells in you. Where you step, God steps. Your presence and his presence become one. When you walk into rooms, conversations change. When you walk into rooms, sickness starts to lose its hold. When you walk into rooms, demons begin to flee. Think about the manifested power of the Holy Spirit that rested on Christ. When he he would show up on the scene the demons would manifest and start screaming don't torment us they would want to get away from him they wanted nothing to do with him my friend the same spirit who raised christ from the dead dwells in you and that has the same effect on demonic powers today they don't want to get anywhere near you when you begin to walk like god has called you to walk we have an identity crisis here's the problem everybody's talking about the identity crisis in the world Everybody's talking about the identity crisis in culture, but there's an identity crisis in the kingdom of God where people don't know who they are, who they're created to be. 
Now, again, let me tie all the threads together. I'm not saying that nothing will ever go wrong. I'm not saying you'll never face trial or tragedy or unwelcome circumstances. I'm saying even in all those things, you can have perfect peace, perfect joy, perfect love, perfect spiritual stability within. Because no matter what happens around you, greater is he within you. So the enemy saw from the beginning the dominion that God had given to us. He rebels against God out of jealousy, banished to the earth under our dominion. He sees, I can't get my place again. I can't ascend. I am now a fallen creation. So even though I can't ascend, I can get man to descend and live in a fallen state through rebellion. So he tempts Eve. He tempts her by first questioning the word and then contradicting. Eve falls for the temptation. Then Adam joins. Creation falls. But Christ came to redeem that. Christ came to regain that authority. And in him now, we have that authority. In him now, we have that power. Will you be attacked? Yes. Will the enemy tempt you and try to torment you? And will he try to confuse you and cause division? And will he try to deceive you? Yes, yes, yes. The enemy attacks. That's why we have to put on the armor of God. But you have to remember that we fight from the place of victory. The enemy fights from the desperate position of spiritual defeat. The enemy has been defeated. He made a show of these powers of darkness. He demonstrated his greatness. You are of light. You are not in darkness. And don't let the enemy lie to you telling you that you are. Don't let the enemy exaggerate his power over you. It's time you begin to think like a son of God. It's time you begin to step into that new nature that he gave you when you believe. This identity crisis has to end. It has to end. Otherwise, you'll just live the rest of your life thinking you need more deliverance like it's a substance instead of stepping into the deliverance he's already given to you by the renewing of your mind, by a lifestyle of prayer, by knowing the word, by walking in the spirit, the basics of Christianity. You live the Christian life, you live in freedom. It's that simple. Father, I pray you help them do it. Father, I pray you help them do it. Help me do it too, Lord, all of us. And I pray, precious Holy Spirit, that you would allow these truths to take deep root in our heart. Lord, remove deception. Help us to begin to think like sons, not like servants. Father, I thank you that you've redeemed us from the powers of darkness. I thank you that your Holy Spirit dwells in us. I thank you that you've placed us in light. Jesus, I thank you. Some of you are sensing that power. Come on, you now just receive. Father, I thank you that your power is touching each life. Just take a moment now. Don't. I want you to ignore the flesh. The flesh is trying to get out of this right now. You know why? Because prayer is the death of the flesh. And so your flesh is looking for a distraction. Say no to the flesh, yes to the Holy Spirit. Receive this now. Thank you, Lord. Power's flowing. Power from on high. Break every mind. Shatter every ungodly mindset. Remind them of who they are in you. Jesus, I give you the praise. Thank you that your healing virtue is flowing. Thank you that your delivering power is flowing. Receive that deliverance now in Jesus' name. Receive that healing now in Jesus' name. Give you praise and glory and honor. I want you to say it because you believe it. Say amen. If you enjoyed this message and you think other believers need to hear it, Make sure you leave a like on the video. Yes, that actually makes a huge difference. And don't forget to subscribe to my channel. I teach on the Holy Spirit, prayer, spiritual warfare, and similar topics. I also live stream events where the power of the Holy Spirit moves and people are saved, healed, delivered, and empowered. And before we close here, let me just mention that there's actually a way that you can help our ministry. Our ministry hosts events around the world. Our ministry releases content and live streams for free. And if you'd like to help us continue on our mission, then I want you to go right now to davidhernandezministries.com slash donate to give a single donation, davidhernandezministries.com slash partner to become a monthly supporter. Those monthly partnerships are very key for what we're doing because they add consistent growth so that we can continue to expand. And by the way, God's favor is on this ministry. This ministry is expanding rapidly but steadily and lives are being transformed. You can be a part of it. Maybe you've been blessed by this ministry. You believe in what we're doing. You love souls. You love Jesus. You love the gospel. You love this ministry. It's time to get involved. Do your part. Get involved right now. Again, by going to davidhernandezministries.com. 
There is no gift so small that it doesn't count. There is no gift so large that we wouldn't know what to do with it. Every gift, large or small, single gifts or monthly gifts, everything makes a difference. So go right now. I can actually see some of the donations coming in on the website. Do try the website, davidhernandezministries.com. If the website doesn't work for your currency and country, then of course you can use other means of giving, such as social media, and then there's other other means of giving that are listed on the website. But do try the website first. Even if you haven't been able to give to other ministries, uh, we actually accept a lot of currencies from a lot of different places, even, even as far as cryptocurrency and so forth. Just try the website first, and if the website doesn't work, then of course you can give uh, through other listed means. Thank you, Aaliyah, for your generous gift. Thank you, Bernardo, for becoming a partner. Tanya, thank you for becoming a partner. Sharissa, thank you for your gift. We so appreciate your support of this ministry. Kathy just became a partner. Thank you so much. And then I also see uh, that Cheryl gave a single gift. Thank you so much, Cheryl. Zachary, thank you for your gift. I also see one coming in from Patrice. Thank you for becoming a partner. And many, many, many gifts coming in uh, to the Patrick family, our dear friends. Thank you for your very generous gift. Uh, Shamaria, thank you for your gift. Uh, Tanya, thank you for becoming a partner. Another Tanya, thank you for becoming a partner. Wow, Cindy and so many others. I so appreciate your giving from around the world. It all goes to help the ministry. Thank you for your support. And remember, until next time, nothing is impossible with God.